in Bath, and I think I want to start this. Tonight, we are coming to you from Bath, the beautiful city in Somerset, England. It is about 12 miles inland from the west coast and, uh, well, close to Bristol. You may not think that Bath and uh, Iceland have anything particular in common, but they surely do. In Britain, Bath is probably the only place where hot springs bubble up to the surface, like they do in so many places in Iceland. It is a geothermal hotspot. Although the waters are not as hot as they are in Iceland, they still were suitable for establishing a center by the Romans to bathe in. The story goes further back. And the, the powers of this land are told in the story of King Blatut, which goes like this. The year is 863 BC. Blatut, king of the Britons and father of the unfortunate King Lear, who was immortalized by Shakespeare, had spent much of his youth studying in Athens, where he contracted leprosy. Returning home and realizing that an imperfect prince could not inherit the throne, he left the royal palace in disguise to take a job as a swineherd in an untraveled part of the country. This was certainly the Avon Valley and may well have been the area we know today as Kensim. As Plato drove his pits in search of acorns, he crossed the river Avon at shallow north of Saltport, at a place which subsequently took his name from the legend, Swinesford. The rest of the story is famous. Blatut pigs also contracted his disease, but were cured when they rolled in the hot mud around Bath's spring. Observing the miracle, Blatut also bathed in the hot, murky water, and he too was cured. Returning home in triumph, he went on to become a king. In gratitude for his cure, Blatut founded a city at Bath and dedicated it to curative powers to the Celtic goddess Sue. And 900 years later, the Roman called the city Aqua Sulis, the waters of Sue. Today, people from all over the world come to Bath to enjoy the curative waters of the Roman baths. Alfred the Great was born in 871 AD and as his name suggests, was a great king of Wessex. He eventually succeeded in fighting and beating a fierce and formidable Viking army after many battles. He was nearly killed in a surprise attack at, in Chippenham in 878, escaping with a small band of his soldiers. He retreated to the Somerset levels, to Athelney, a small island rising from the surrounding masses. It was here that he is reputed to have burned the cakes he was asked to look after because he was too busy plotting his counterattack on the Vikings. Cakes or not, he raised an army south of Bath at the Selwood near Froome and won a decisive battle at Ethandun in May 1878 AD. To defend against future attacks, 
he built a ring of forts or berths from which we get the present day borough around his kingdom of Wessex. These included Bath, where he rebuilt what was left of the old Roman defenses, probably repairing parts of the old wall using pieces of the dilapidated Roman architecture and using earth and wood to improve the defensive line. He also laid down a typical Saxon street plan with a wide central street following a part of the current day Westgate Street. The high street north of where the Norman built Bath Abbey is today was probably the Saxon site for the market. Alfred the Great rebuilt Bath after uh, his victory over Guthrum, the Viking. However, uh, there have never been found any direct evidence of the Viking presence here in Bath, except one. It is uh, a mysterious sword that was found here in uh, archaeological dig uh, in 1981. And uh, this sword that was found here, right at this uh, wall, uh, of the old uh, bath, uh, which has caused a lot of confusion. But I'm going to let uh, Sophie, who was the assistant at the Roman bath uh, collection, Sophia, uh, explain a little bit about this mysterious enigma, the sword of a fella who um, was called the Ulfert. Well, he was the maker of the sword, but there's something to this that you just gotta hear. So let Sophia take over. It's quite interesting that you can follow something called the typology of the hilt, so this area of the sword here. Um, and with Saxon and Viking swords, this changes over a sort of uh, the entire range of that time period, mainly in the shape of the pummel, so this part of the hilt, the top part. Um, and it lands nicely in the middle of the 10th century as this uh, kind of triangular pummel that you've got here. We've got one that's called a three lobed pummel that's got a little blob on one side, a central piece, and then one on the left hand side. But that sort of triangular shape, very, very typically Viking. Um, two sided blade as well, so it's not got one edge on it, it's got two edges that you can use for cutting in two directions. And it's a one handed sword, so when that had a grip on it, you would have used just one hand to hold it. There is Viking writing upon it. Yes, so this is one of the most fantastic things about this sword. Firstly, the preservation. Um, when it was found, uh, the remains of the scabbard were actually found uh, lying above the sword. We were able to tell the makeup of the scabbard. So it's got uh, wooden and leather and sort of fur, um, a combination holding uh, uh, it together. But as that degraded preferentially to the metal of the sword, it's actually meant that the blade has been preserved so well that not only can you see this strange writing on the blade, it's also preserved a black patina uh, on the rest of the blade. That's not any type of corrosion um, on the original. Uh, it's actually an intentional sort of patina to make it look and shine black, which is quite rare for a sword. Um, the writing itself is, yes, uh, it's actually a name. So this is a name, Ulfert. Um, and Ulfert swords are actually found throughout Europe. Now, the original theory for this is that um, Ulfert is a, a blacksmith or a smith or a sword maker. And um, it would have been like a mark of sort of uh, a brand almost. But the thing is that also it's very, very good at making these swords. They're all extremely high quality. They're beautifully made. Um, and they're actually quite well preserved in the archaeological record. However, there are so many of them and they stretch for about 250 years, which suggests that it wasn't just one man. It wasn't just Ulfer who was making these. This brand lived on from his name. So he created these wonderful swords. And then in the years uh, following his death, they carried on making them. They carried on with the same sort of prestige as well. Now, ours is theoretically an Ulfer. You can see on this replica that the letters have been uh, painted on. And uh, you can see that they've been painted on with little gaps in. And that's because although our preservation is good, we can't quite tell exactly what all of these letters are. It does follow the pattern for all third swords and the letters are fairly in the right places. You also have these Greek crosses, so the square crosses uh, within the name, which again, is fairly typical of the ones that are found throughout Europe. But you have reason to believe this is a fake. I wouldn't say the word fake, because that implies that somebody today has come along and made a fake Viking sword and we've got it in our collection and we think it's Viking, but it's not. But 
I think this is more uh, of a knockoff. So your uh, cheap pair of branded sort of trainers, the ones that you might get from a market store, for example. So something that looks like a real all but sword, but isn't quite. Um, and this is because of another edition uh, after the name. So again, this is very difficult to see on the replica, but through the use of x-rays, they've looked at the way that this uh, blade was made. And um, in order to put the silver lettering in, you uh, make an incision, you make a cut into the blade so that, that it's filled in to those spaces. So with an x-ray, you can see where the original letter would have been, even if you've ended up with a kind of smushed pattern at the end there. Um, and these words are thought to make up the words mesthetic or mesthetic, uh, which means made me. So the implication is also made me. Now, after what I've said previously, that makes sense. Uh, I've said also the blacksmith uh, is making these swords and it's his product. So of course that makes sense. However, out of all of the also swords that have been found and recognized, none of them say mesthetic. Absolutely none of them that have been found so far. However, there are other types of swords, um, also made by other blacksmiths. There's a, a rival company around about the same point in time um, called Ingelry Swords. And again, it says the word Ingelry down the blade. And there's a few of those that after that word say mephetic, but none of the Ulfurt ones do. Now, the reason I think that this is a bit of a knockoff is because not only is Ulfurt written slightly differently to the other examples, we've also got one that says mephetic. So maybe somebody's got a bit confused somewhere along the line. They've seen an in-gallery somewhere, they've seen an Ulfurt somewhere, and they've kind of smushed the two ideas together. And the other reason I think this is because the other British swords are all a little bit odd. They're all sort of spelt wrong, the examples of these Ulfurt ones, or there's something just a bit off about them. The other part is the pattern on the back. Ulfurt swords all have these um, lines and kind of diamond shaped patterns on the reverse side. And um, in gallery, you tend to have a different sort of pattern. And this is usually fairly sort of standard on the Ulfurt sword. But again, the British ones, there's always something a little bit funky going on, something a little bit strange. So there's a theory that we actually have these being produced in Britain in this kind of style that originally is coming from uh, sort of Frankish areas, so rather than Scandinavia, uh, more from uh, the Rhine. Now, ours, however, because they're either felt wrong or a little bit strange, are more possibly being made in Britain. Sadly, we can't exactly prove it, but it's a really interesting thing that hopefully, with sort of future discoveries of more of these swords, which is happening every day, as more and more museums look at the swords they have in their collections with more modern techniques, using x-ray on blades that have never been x-rayed before, more and more of these swords are becoming recognised. So who knows, maybe in the future we'll find another one like ours and maybe it's not a knockoff. Regardless of whether or not it is a knockoff, mm. it's still a valuable object and would have belonged to someone of high rank. Absolutely. Um, regardless of it being a slightly wonky old the, the the way that the blade, is, the blade is made is actually rather beautiful. When I was talking about the black pattern earlier, that is not easy or cheap to do. And altogether, swords like this are absolutely weapons of status. In the sort of Viking and Saxon period, not everybody would have used a sword in battle. Um, it's usually your most uh, sort of wealthy um, of, of warriors. You'll have things like spears and axes being used on the battlefield by people of a slightly lower uh, class. Also with this sword in particular, we have evidence um, that the hilt would have been wrapped in silver thread or silver wire as well. So there's that extra addition of, of sort of expensive materials. Plus, like I said, that black pattern and the writing on the blade. No matter what, coming up against a warrior on the battlefield, he's waving a sword around with a silver coloured hilt and a big black blade with writing on it, you'd be terrified. The real sort of wealth, wealth, status and power. What's the uh, current theory as to how it ended up where it did? An interesting question. Um, I personally wouldn't like to land in any particular um, court with this theory because there's just so many ways that things can end up in archaeological records. The difficult thing about this is there's not a lot of information about where exactly uh, the sword itself was found in terms of stratigraphy. So it was actually found after the excavation ended. So we just simply don't have that information. So trying to infer where it lies within the area it was deposited, very hard. But you're looking at the city walls and we have evidence of uh, you know, medieval and Saxon life continuing in this area. We know that this was a time period riddled with warfare. And if somebody had a sword like this, perhaps they were involved in a skirmish. There are some theories that this is possible. Maybe it was dumped after a battle. But also, um, I one of my longest lasting theories, uh, pretty much any kind of uh, exciting, expensive, or rather stylish object, 
that has been sort of dumped somewhere a bit suspicious, like the edge of the city walls, is how do we know that this wasn't just stolen or taken from somebody and it's been dumped somewhere to come pick up later or someone sort of getting rid of the evidence, maybe? Pure speculation. I get very excited about these things. We <laughs> probably will never know, but it's nice to see it right, isn't it? You're a right little Miss Marple, you are. <laughs> um, I take it this is a period when the Saxons and the Vikings were fighting over the territory? Well, the thing is, it's a it's a very difficult period to pin down in terms of that. Um, you have eventually a division between land very roughly between the north and the south, with the Vikings sort of settling up in Jorvik um, and the south being sort of brought together under Alfred the Great. But this is a very kind of uh, tricky situation where it's a nice idea to say that yes, peace was formed and um, they sort of lived in harmony. Harmony, it's not the case. Uh, people always always fight over land. Um, it's just interesting to think why somebody with such a beautiful sword um, was fighting or using it or holding it near the walls of that. Wow. I certainly enjoyed that. You know, I I, I love these uh, stories, and but the people almost conquer up about that just that they find uh, buried in the ground. But uh, uh, we know for for sure that the Vikings uh, were around uh, this place. Uh, whether a Viking actually left that particular sword, that sort of Rolex sword, uh, take Rolex sword. <laughs> uh, behind, uh, uh, we don't know, but uh, uh, there were uh, the Vikings uh, that uh, uh, came into England, they were from Denmark, of course, and Norway, and there were some from Iceland. Actually, in the Icelandic sagas, we have a quite accurate description of their travels in Iceland and what battles they fought uh, in here in England. Uh, in particular, the most famous one probably is uh, A.J. Skatla Grimson. I have uh, mentioned A.J. Skatla Grimson before. He is uh, the warrior poet, but... Uh, A.J. Skatla Grimson was born at the uh, Borg in Iceland, probably around 910, but he... Whoops. <laughs> I think I've lost you guys. No? I was going to share that with you. Oh, here I am. Okay, uh, I, I've got uh, something prepared on A.H. Scatla Grimson and his uh, life and uh, adventures here in England. So I, I might as well just put that up uh, right away. So that you can see that. Here we go. And we will start at the beginning. Technology. Here we go. Hey, it's Cutler Grimson and his exploits in England and elsewhere. Hey, it's Cutler Grimson was born at the Borg in Iceland, probably around 910, but he didn't die until 990. And he was one of the greatest Icelandic skaldic poets whose adventures, life, and verses are preserved in the Eil Saga, which is attributed to Snorri Sturluson, the greatest Icelandic uh, scholar and writer of uh, past days. The saga portrays Eil as a having a dual nature derived from his mixed descent from fair extroverted Vikings and dark tuck to turn Sami Laps. He was headstrong, vengeful, and greedy. He was greedy for gold, but also a loyal friend, a shy lover, a devoted father. As a young man, he killed the son of Eric Bloodbex, Eric I, and placed a curse upon the king, which he inscribed upon a pole in magic runes. Later shipwrecked off the coast of uh, Northumbria in England, he fell into Eric's hands, sometimes around 948, but saved his own life by composing in a single night the long praise poem, Hervilus Hatt's Ransom, 
praising Eric in a unique and rhymed matter. This is a form of poetry. Another long phrase poem, Aren Bjarnar Kvida, the lay of Arabjörn is also attributed to him. Shortly after the death of his two sons, Eid locked himself in his enclosed bed and refused food. His daughter coaxed him into writing a poem. So he composed the deeply personal lament Sonarterek, loss of sons, or revenge denied. The poem is also a family portrait in which he recalls the death of his parents as well. In it, the desire for revenge and hatred of Odin overwhelms him, but gradually he bows his head in resignation and gratitude for the poetic gifts that the God has bestowed upon him. After finishing the poem, Eyjad resumed his normal life. He lived to be an old and blind man to write and to lament on his senility. This poem he actually recited to his mother as a child. My mother wants a price paid to purchase my proud or ship. Standing high in the stern, I succor for plunder. The stout Viking steersman of this shining vessel. Then home to harbor after hewing down a man or two. I have to end the poem or this portion on A. H. Katla Grimson on Sandstrom from Gelting Atales. This is the, it was the sort of latest uh, pictures that we uh, got from there. Very nice uh, footage that we are intend to share uh, with you in, in much, much longer, for much, much longer at later date. A. <clears> H. <throat> Katla Grimson, uh, I like to uh, take people uh, to his home in a Borg, which is it's about an hour and a half drive from Reykjavik. And uh, you, you always pass it when you go to Snæfellsnes. And uh, those of you that have been to Iceland may remember that statue that the, uh, I showed you in the video uh, of Eyjall lamenting his son and, and, uh, and uh, the death of his son and his daughter tricking him to drink milk uh, and uh, uh, he sort of revived after that. But his story is so incredibly Icelandic and uh, these, these, uh, his dual nature of, of a kind of a gentle and soft man who wrote poetry and uh, was able to, to uh, melt the hearts of kings with his praise and uh, on the other hand, he was he was quite a, a violent man and, uh, and 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 quite cruel actually. He was outlawed from Iceland and uh, then he uh, went to Norway. Uh, he was outlawed because he, had, he killed too many, <laughs> once too many in Iceland, obviously, and uh, it didn't go any better for him in Norway. He put together a gang basically of of robbers, and uh, they rode uh, from one fjord to another in Norway, robbing the farmers. And uh, the, usually they, they would uh, show up and expect to be offered all the best that the farmers had. And if they didn't give it to them, they would take it. And uh, they would, uh, uh, even if they felt offended somehow, they would burn uh, down the, the farms. And uh, then in one instance, for example, they returned back to kill everyone uh, so that the uh, to be certain that they would be remembered for that particular raid. Uh, 
there's a famous story about uh, this farmer coming out to greet uh, uh, him, uh, quite uh, withdrawn and uh, apologetic, smiling nevertheless, saying that he has nothing to offer, nothing to offer uh, his man or himself. Now, in those days, they rode around uh, in full armor and they had their shields tied to their legs uh, on their horse uh, as they rode on the horses. And Aetli uh, leads the rides his horse right up to the smiling farmer and then lifts his foot and kicks him in the mouth so that his mouth ripped open up to the ears, as it says. And uh, Aet uh, says, well, now you have an even a bigger smile to greet me with when I come again. And uh, of course he was uh, made outlawed from Norway and then he went to England. And uh, he actually fought uh, several battles uh, with the Scots mostly uh, on behalf of Eric the Blood Axe and so on. And it was actually Eric that gave him all the gold that he was to bring back to Iceland actually to compensate his dad for he had enticed his brother to come to England and fight for Eric as well and he died in that battle. So the gold and the silver that uh, he was to be he, he was given was to be given to his dad. Well he never did give his uh, treasure to his dad and uh, he died uh, before before he died, he buried his treasure somewhere in Mosfellsdalur, they say, which is very close to Reykjavik. People have been looking for it, but never found it. And uh, obviously, he uh, also is said to have killed the two slaves that uh, helped him bury the treasures. So that sort of is a, uh, seems to be follow many of the stories of buried treasures that the people that actually dig them down, they, they die before, so nobody can know where they are. But the uh, Eil Saga is, uh, has been translated into English, it's very adventurous, and uh, once you get uh, used to reading the sagas, you really start to uh, sort of feel the atmosphere in them, and uh, they have a very, very uh, special way of, uh, of moving the, the story onward. You, you can almost always uh, guess when something is going to happen. They, they, they have a kind of a rhythm in that way. Uh, special literature that uh, you should definitely acquaint yourself with uh, before coming to Iceland. And uh, well, even if you are not planning to come to Iceland, you will, I'm sure you will enjoy it. Get the, either Eil Saga or uh, Njál Saga or even Grettis Saga. Njál saga is, uh, is, uh, is yet another adventurous saga about heroes and, and, uh, and uh, treacherous advice, bad men and good men. And Grettir, the strongest man, the strongest Icelander that ever lived, his story is told in Grettir saga. So, um, there have been uh, some suggestions that uh, maybe I could uh, get some of these sagas and read them up here. Uh, I don't know how that would go over, uh, but uh, maybe for just a special section that could be done, uh, but uh, we'll see. For now, I'm happy to, to tell a, a few, few uh, just stories from the sagas, like I have been doing. So uh, I was going to keep this quite short today. And uh, I know that, uh, that uh, I'm not in Iceland, as you see, so I haven't got any, any, any more uh, stuff from Iceland. I wasn't able to, to go out and, 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 and take any, any shots or footage from Iceland. So I'm gonna call it quiz tonight. And uh, short and sassy, Thank you all for coming along and uh, joining me. Hope that uh, you will do so as well uh, next Wednesday when uh, I will have something prepared for a little longer than, than just half an hour. So, cheers.
good night.